I greet you today in Jesus' name. If somebody's sitting next to you and their clothes don't match, or maybe they are not ironed very well, have grace on them. They probably don't have power. Um, we don't have power, and so it was a leap of faith picking out clothes last night at dusk. But I had a cold shower today, so baby, I'm ready to roll. I don't, uh, you know, uh, in, in, all, in all honesty, I mean, I, of course, I'll be honest with you, but the cold shower humbles you if you're not used to it. You jump in there, it's like... <laughs> don't want all my family to hear that. <laughs> oh, that's so cold. Woo, woo, woo. Anyway, I'm ready to go today. Nah, it, it's good to see your smiling face. And if you're visiting with us, I'm Pastor Ryan, and we're so glad to join with you today in the house of the Lord. Um, That worship blessed me, and I needed it. And so uh, what an honor it is to join with you. Dear ones, in these weeks, we have been looking at the heart of Christ. And we've been asking the Lord to teach us and grow us in those things As we head into next month, it's the end of September, as we head into October, we are beginning on October October 1st, we are beginning a 31-day prayer focus, and the 31-day prayer focus is come to me. Because in Matthew chapter 11, there we go, thank you, in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus He gives us the key to learning his heart and learning how to rest in him. And it begins with this, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. Come to me. He doesn't say talk about it on Sunday mornings. He says, you come to me. If you are weary and heavy laden today, Jesus doesn't say just sit there and listen. He says, come to me. How do we come to the Lord? We come to him in prayer. That's how we come to the Lord. So as we head into October, we invite you to join us on a 31-day prayer focus. It's called Come to Me. We're going to read the scripture. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. There it is. Come to me. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. As we head into this month, uh, uh, check out the Church Center app. If you don't have that, you can, you can hook up to the church on the church website, clichurch.org, and you can check out the events there. Um, as we head into this month, if you are interested, and I would encourage you to do this, uh, register. You can sign up to be part of our daily prayer encouragement, scripture and encouragements that are going to go out every day through the month of October. I've read a few of those. Pastor Brian, our prayer pastor, is working on those. They're powerful. They will encourage you. So you can sign up on there, and that will connect you to a group. And each day in that group, a a, a devotional text will go out. It will go out to that group in the Church Center app. Now, for those of you that that are questioning, I'd like to, to remind you that in the Church Center app, when you get in there, you... If you look at it, you, you are part of different groups uh, when you hook up to the life of the body here at CLI. For each group that you're part of, if you're like me, I can't, I can't have my phone going off 47 times every 10 minutes. I just can't do it. So what I have to do often is mute certain conversations. Not because I don't love those people, but because I do love those people. And so I have to mute those things. In the Church Center app, you can mute any conversation that you need to, okay? So if you say, I don't need my phone buzzing. Now listen, it's just going to be a single text every day. Um, That's what's going to be in that group. So get signed up for that. But as you're part of these groups, keep in mind that you can can control the uh, notifications that come to your phone. And that's just in the app. That doesn't even count your phone control. So anyway, check that out. All right. So daily prayer. And then Wednesday nights through October are going to be very special. On October 2nd, join us on that Wednesday night. We're going to be praying for the nations. We're going to be praying for the nations 
that are part of our CLI family and also praying for the nations to which our CLI uh, teams have gone and ministered. So we'll be praying for for, uh, all over the world from European nations to African nations to Asian nations to to, uh, everywhere across the globe we're going to be praying, okay? Uh, We've got a lot of those ready. That's October 2nd. On October 9th, Wednesday night, October 9th, we're going to have a special group with us from Emmanuel University. It's the Resound uh, Singers Group. And my daughter Becky, who's in this weekend, she's sitting over there, whoop, whoop. She's part of that Resound team. It'll bless your socks off. And if you're not wearing socks, it'll bless your sandals off. So you come that Wednesday night and your heart will be encouraged and focused on Christ. That's Resound It's a youth service. It's focused primarily on youth, but everyone is invited. On October 16th, we're going to have a praise and worship and prayer night. And our plan at this point is to have it outdoors underneath the beautiful white tent that Helene didn't didn't agree with. Um, A hurricane decided to uh, test it, and it failed. But we got some guys looking at that today, so hopefully the tent will stand again. We'll see. All right. That's October 16th. We're going to be out there. October 23rd is going to be a special Wednesday night prayer service joining with Awakened Student Ministries. We're going to go down there with them. It'll bless you. And then on October the 30th, we're going to set our hearts and we're going to pray for the United States of America. Somebody say, we, got a, we have a calling to pray for our nation. It is wrong of us to sit there and badmouth and condemn and say there is no hope for our nation. Dear ones, you're still here, and I'm still here too. God has a plan in this nation if we'll call on him. Hallelujah. And the Lord, speaking to his people Israel, but I believe that the principles are the same for the sons and daughters of the king. If my people called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and I'll heal their land. So hallelujah. Revival in our, follow, follow me through this, revival in our land will not be a top down. Once we get the right dude in office or the right person in office or the right individual in office on the, all these levels, then revival will come. Mm-mm. You know what, if I remember the city of Ephesus, what happened is so many people came to know Jesus that the life of the Holy Spirit and the life of the kingdom began to to, to swell up and the idol industry in that city of Ephesus was shut down. Loved ones, let me me just go as far as this. We, We pray for an end to abortion in our nation because the Bible is profoundly pro life. We pray, that's just one, just one thing. But what we always think is, well, we've got to get laws that will fix it. You know what? What if we ask God to bring an awakening in our nation where, where places just had to close because all of a sudden salvation was coming in homes and in hearts? What if, what if when we call on the Lord we see a, a swell of the kingdom happening in cities and a swell of the Holy Spirit and an awakening in our nation such that it's no longer the most prominent discussion because what's happened is God has changed the tide in our nation. That will not happen unless the people of God pray. So let's pray. We're going to pray for our nation. Register to vote. If you are not registered to vote, even Jesus said to Peter, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. The principle then is engage at the level that you need to. There is a stewardship that's been placed in our hands as a nation. It's called democracy. It means that you have a voice. It means means that we must use our voice to speak for the things we ought to speak for. How do we do that? We vote. How do you do that? All right, listen, register to vote. It's not okay for you to sit back and say, you know what, whatever's going to be is going to be. This whole thing's going to uh, hell in a handbasket. That's a lie from hell. That's a lie from hell. That's a lie from hell. God has a plan for our nation. So let's engage as stewards of the good things of God. Vote. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. Vote. It's not okay 
to sit back and say, you know what, I'm done with this whole shooting match. Man, I got kids growing up. If my people called by my name will humble themselves. And that's what we're going to do. And then there's also going to be a special moment in the month of October. We'll let you know more about this. October 14th through 24th. It's 10 days. October 14th through 24th. There's going to be daily prayer. And the church is going to be open every day from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Every day. All day from October 14th through October 24th. And every evening, except for Sunday evenings and Wednesday evening, and then, of course, our regular Roar prayer meeting, there will be intercessory worship happening in the chapel from 7 to 9 each evening. So there'll be someone there leading. There'll be, there'll be someone in there uh, uh, calling on God, and they'll be doing that uh, leading worship. And so every night from October 14 through 24, there's going to be live worship happening. But the church is going to be open all of those days, October 14th through 24th, from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Set your heart, set your calendar, let's call on the Lord together as we go after him. Praise God. Something very quickly I want to share with you that's, that I've shared with our Wednesday night prayer group, and it's, it was a blessing to them, it's a blessing to me. But we believe that God has called us here at Christian Life to be a house of prayer. Jesus didn't say that my house should be called a house of preaching or a house of singing. He didn't say that my house would be called a house of fellowship or even a, a house of classes. He said my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations. And so we believe that we're called to be a house of prayer. Um, in these next months and even heading into next year, we're going to continue to grow in those things. In October, we're going to continue to grow as a house of prayer. This morning, I want to share with you super quickly 10 prayer values that define our hearts and set, and set the direction that we're going to go, okay? This is, we're not perfect in these things by any means, by, by, by any stretch of the imagination, but these are the things where we're going. All right, let's show some of those, all right? The 10 prayer values. Number one, we value prayer. Therefore, we will feature prayer in our worship and we'll make prayer the central element of all ministry that we do here at this church in Jesus' name. All right, let's go to the next one. We are a praying people. Would you read that with me? We are a praying people. Read it louder. We are a praying people. Therefore, we will nurture at home daily prayer, providing resources and training and nudging new and seasoned Christians to deepen their prayer lives. Number three, this is good. It's a lot of words, but I want you to listen. We believe that we are a kingdom of priests. Read that out loud with me. We believe that we are a kingdom of priests, that prayer and worship are our highest calling, and that as priests, we are not only recipients of blessing, but the conveyors of blessing. Therefore, in prayer, we choose to pray for the favor and blessing of God. Protective care upon our pastor. Amen. The church staff, the church family, our city, and our nation. We bless, we do not curse. We ask God not for what we deserve, but for blessing. We ask for grace and mercy. That's our prayer in the name of the Lord. That's good stuff right there. Number four, read it out loud with me. You ready? We value holiness and righteousness. And we recognize that our nation needs revival. Therefore, we regularly and consistently cry out to God for a great awakening for our nation. Number five. Read it with me. We believe in the power of petition, that God answers prayer. Therefore, we faithfully take the needs of the church, the city, and the world before the throne of God, and we ask for grace. Amen. Amen. Number six, read it with me. We believe 
and the power of intercession. Therefore, we will identify, train, team, and mobilize intercessors from the undergirding of the ministries of the church and the support of the various, whoop, there we go, thank you. Ready to go, thank you team up there, thank you Nico. And support of the various mission endeavors of the church. We believe in the power of intercession. Number seven, read it with me. We believe prayer is essential to the success of every endeavor. Read that again. We believe prayer is essential to the success of every endeavor. That without him we can do nothing and whatever we do in his behalf without dependence on him is less than it might have been given dependence in prayer. Therefore, our rule is no one works unless someone prays. Mm, that's good stuff. Number eight, read it with me. We believe that the reception of the gospel unto salvation is a spiritual issue. Therefore, we pray for the harvest, that blind eyes will be open to the gospel, that closed hearts will be open to the truth of Christ. And that the gospel will go forth in power out of prayer. Amen. How about this? Number nine. Read it with me. We believe there is a definitive connection between prayer and the harvest. Therefore, we insist that prayer must have a missional dimension. That we must pray for lost loved ones and the unreached in our city and in the world. Number 10, it's the last one. We believe God governs the world by the prayers of his people. Therefore, we pray for our city, our state, and our national leaders. We pray about world conditions and various global crises. We are called to be a house of prayer. We are called to be a house of prayer. And by the name and the strength of the Lord and leading of the Holy Spirit, let it be. No one works unless someone's praying in the name of the Lord. I wanted to share those things with you as we head into next month. Let these things, we'll, we'll be mentioning these again. Uh, through the next month. So I look forward to sharing and, and looking at scripture for some of these with you. Now, we come again today to the heart of Christ. And I'm excited about sharing with you. Uh, turn to your neighbor and just tell him something. I need to drink some water. So give me, give me 30 seconds, all right? I don't care what you say to him. All right. Would you pull up Galatians 2 and verse 20 for me? Galatians 2 and verse 20. Thank you. Let's just hold that right there. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm going to read that again. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Father, we receive your heart. We receive your voice. We receive your word. Lord, may your great name be lifted up. And Father, we pray for clarity. Pray for clarity from your Holy Spirit, illuminating your word for our hearts and for our lives. And we pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
we are coming to, the, to a transitional moment in our, what we've been looking at on Sunday mornings. And so this will be the last one where we're looking at the dimensions of the heart of Christ. As we move into next month, we're going to be looking at how we respond and how we function in this world in light of the heart of Jesus. But today, as we come to this, this last moment looking at the deep heart of Jesus, I pray that more than ever before in your life and my life, that we, brothers and sisters here at Christian Life International, pray that we would have a revelation of the beauty and the power of the gospel like we have never had before in our lives. I pray that we would see the gospel of Jesus for its strength and its beauty and and we would see the heart of Jesus for the beautiful Savior that he is. If there's anything in in our lives, if there's anything in our hearts and anything in our minds that's clouding the great love of God, I pray today by the power of the Holy Spirit and the strength of the word of God that those clouds would be blown away that so we could see the great love of God and learn again about the strength of the gospel. Right now, the love of God is strong. Right now, his love for you is stronger than you could ever know or imagine. Right now, his care for you is greater than you could ever fathom. Right now, his love for you is high as the heavens are above the earth. Right now, his love is infin- uh, in, in, infinitely beyond what you could ever understand, what I could ever understand. We understand that right now it's raining again outside. But what we know is the sun is shining up above those clouds, right? We know it. And if you jumped on a, on a plane right now, it would take just a little bit and probably leaving Roanoke, you'd go through a bump or two. But then all of a sudden you would come out on top of the clouds and the sun is shining in all its brilliance. Sometimes our, our, our sinful minds sometimes our broken fallen minds what we allow is sinfulness in our lives to 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 cover up the mighty love of God and the beauty of the gospel and and we don't think he's shining quite as brightly but it's not he's not the one that's not shining it's those things that we've allowed to 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 shade his great love so in the name of the Lord I pray the wind of the Holy Spirit would blow today and get those clouds out of the way, or by the Holy Spirit that you'd be lifted up on wings like eagles, and that you would fly above those clouds, and you would see how great his love is for you today. I want you to think for a moment with me. Consider just a a simple story of a 12-year-old boy. A 12-year-old boy has grown up in in a loving family that 12 year old boy has has known nothing but the love of his parents but for some reason that 12 year old son kind of wakes up to the world and the way of, of the world and the way that things work in the world and this son who has known nothing but love all of a sudden decides you know what I'm gonna have to pull my weight around here and all of a sudden, that son decides that he's, he needs to make sure. And the way that he, he, he needs to make sure and keep his mom and daddy happy with him. And so that 12-year-old son says, you know what, I'm, I've got to get up every day and I've got to work really, really, really hard. I've got to work really, really, really hard. And I've got to, I've got to scrub the kitchen and I'm going to have to scrub the floors and 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 every day I've got I've got to get up and and work hard and in in fact I know that they they tell me that there's a birth certificate around here somewhere I'm going to I'm going to have to print my own birth certificate just to make sure that my belonging to this family is is sure and that 12 year old boy decides that uh he's going to have to labor and 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 begin to work and all of a sudden there's a there's a fretfulness that begins to happen in his life and in that fretfulness in that fretfulness finally his mom and daddy look at him and say son sit down what in the world is going on 
And that 12-year-old boy responds and says, listen, I'm just wanting to make sure that, that uh, I'm, I'm keeping my place in this family. I'm just wanting to make sure that I'm, I'm keeping my place. I'm wanting to make sure that, you know, I'm wanting to make sure that I, my, my position in this family is solid. And a good mom and daddy, a good daddy is going to say to that son, my dear son, you are my son. You did not earn your place as my son. There's nothing that you did to become my son. There's nothing that you produced to become my child. There's not a thing that you did to become one that belongs to me. So my dear son, rest your heart. You didn't get in because of what you did. And by working harder, you can't earn more of our love by working harder. Because you're our son. Because you're our son. Working harder is not going to earn you more because you're our son. I'm going to say that one more time. Working harder, dear child, is not going to earn you more. Because you are a child. I'm going to share with you just a moment about when the gospel of Jesus woke me up. When the gospel of Jesus woke me up. I have loved the Lord as long as I can remember. I came to Jesus when I was six years old. I remember where I was standing on the blue carpet with the yellow pews on Bruffy Street up above McDonald's in Salem. There's a brick building up there. I remember where I was standing that night. I remember Glenard Questenberry preached and at the end of the service he said, Come and anybody that needs to give their hearts to Jesus, now's the time. And all of a sudden, a six-year-old child, I was awake. I knew that I needed Jesus. And so standing next to me was my dad. I said, Dad, how do you ask Jesus into your heart? And my dad, a brilliant theologian, responded, you just ask him. You You just ask him. And so I asked Jesus into my heart. And I began to live my life in love with the Lord learn what it meant to be a child of God and went on through felt the the burden of Jesus in my life knew in 10th grade felt like I was going to be a missionary Uh, and then wanted to go study engineering at Virginia Tech so that I could go to the mission field one day that was that was my plan so I, so I went in that direction, and went to Emmanuel College, met Amy Adams, the movie star. She's sitting right here. She became Amy Adams Linkus, hallelujah. Uh, and I don't, I don't know what happened in my heart. But as the world sometimes turns and sometimes just things begin, what began to settle into my life was a works-based mentality. I love Jesus, but I'd better be a good boy too. I love Jesus, but I got to keep picking myself up by my bootstraps and I got to meet the Lord halfway. That, that wasn't something that somebody taught me. That was something that my, my, my human brain in a fallen world began to live out of. And I began to live and my, my, my burning fire for the Lord kind of started to get a little crusty. And the flame, the flame of, of love for the Lord began to wane a little bit. 
as I worked that engineering job and life just kind of set in and my heart began to grow a little cold. Now, the funny thing is, I was leading worship at a church in Radford while this was happening. Which lets us know that we can play games our whole lives. We can play games our entire life where we proclaim one thing, but we live with cold hearts. And I don't know, I, don't, I, can't, I can't trace it exactly when it happened, but my heart began to grow cold. Just cold to the, to the love of Jesus and cold to the heart of Christ, cold to his, his goodness in my life. And I, I began to get misery because what I began to do was move into a works-based legalism. Like, I got to work it. I got to work. It's up to me. I remember I led worship one Sunday. We had been at church that day. And, and you know, I, I was, Amy and I were the worship leaders. And you would think if, if anybody needs to be having a good time at church, it ought to have been us, right? We went to Sonic after the service one Sunday night. And the, uh, the waitress came out and said, oh, have y'all been shopping all day? And out of my mouth came, man, no, I wish I'd been shopping all day. I wish, I, and Amy said, Ryan, did you hear what you just said? What did I, I just said, I wish I'd been shopping all day. What had happened is a low-level misery had kicked in in my life. A low-level misery where, where I had to work. It was up to me to work. I had to be a good boy. I had, to keep, I had to keep generating good things. And that's the way that I was going to keep people happy. And that's the way I was going to keep God happy. That's the way I was going to keep earning. And, and if God was going to do anything, it was because I'd done my part and I'd worked my part. And I'd done it. And if the Lord was going to do anything, it's because I'd worked my part. And what I didn't realize was as I lived that way, what began to set in was misery in my life. And it came from a legalistic spirit. It's legalism, and it's works-based. It's something that, that Paul says, when you're of works, when you're of works, it's not going to produce life in you. It's going it's to produce other things. And I lived that way, and there are multiple, in the Lord's, in the Lord's beautiful sovereignty, only God can use four or five things at once and they have a collision right in the middle and the good things of God come out of it. Only God can do it. I went into a season in my misery. Now, if you'd asked me, I would have said, I'm not miserable. But as I look back now, I know that I was. Because I was functioning out of a heart of works. My job, I was working an engineering job in Roanoke, was difficult. It wasn't going like I wanted it to go. Uh, and I was applying for other jobs, and that wasn't working out. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a long story, but I was in charge of sewer studies in different cities. Which meant, it, that sounds, it sounds fancy, it meant that I had to put on the suit and crawl down in manholes in a bunch of cities. And insert these flow meters into a couple of feet of you know what. And um, I was miserable. I was miserable. I was praying for the Lord to break that. But there was another track that was happening in my life at that time. The Lord began to use it. We had stopped leading worship at the church in Radford. And we were just kind of in a lull. You know, law. And I, I took part in a ministry called Evangelism Explosions. Anybody know about Evangelism Explosion? Yeah, some of you do. And I thought, all right, well, I'm going to keep working and I'm going to keep being a good boy. Now I'm going to do Evangelism Explosion so that I could get people saved. And Evangelism Explosion is a is a beautiful ministry where you learn how to share the good news of Jesus. You learn how to share the gospel. And this is the way it goes. Grace is how it begins. In grace, heaven is a free gift. And it is not earned and it is not deserved. 
Then in evangelism explosion, you learn about man. Man is a sinner, and he cannot save himself. God is the third thing you talk about in evangelism explosion. God is loving, but he is also holy, and he is just. And so there's a problem that sinful men need a a God who is holy, and sin is in the way. And the Lord solved that problem by bringing Jesus Jesus who came as the God-man. He was fully God yet fully man. The scripture teaches it is so. He lived a perfect life. He shed his blood for me. And the judgment that I deserved he took so that I could have relationship with Father. I studied this out. And as I began to study evangelism explosion to share with other people... What began to happen inside of me was a flame lit again. Because what I realized is I'd spent my, my time, I was spending my time trying to be a good boy. Trying to live it, trying to live right, you know. Now follow me, I'm not saying that it's incorrect to walk in obedience. What, I'm lear- what I learned is this, is that I had made the gospel, I'd made an equation in my life. I said this, the gospel Plus, my good works equal something better than the gospel. The gospel plus my perfection equaled something better than the gospel. That's the equation that I had for any of you math people. I had an equation in my brain. The gospel plus whatever was better than the gospel. But what I learned in evangelism explosion and what the Lord began to do in my life is this. The gospel plus anything is less than the gospel. The gospel plus your good works is not the gospel. It is less than the gospel. The gospel plus your perfection is not the gospel. It is less than the gospel. The gospel plus anything, any equation that we use where we say the gospel plus something else is better than, it's a lie. And Because what happened in me was I started leaning on the good work side of that equation. Okay, Jesus did his part. Now i got to get my good works right and we're going to meet in the middle and that's going to be better than the gospel. Yeah, Jesus did it, but that's not enough. I've got to add my good works to it. And when I add my good works to it, then that's going to be, then I'll really be saved. Listen, dear ones, the gospel plus anything is less than the gospel. I'm going to say that again. The gospel plus anything is less than the gospel. And all of a sudden, my works mentality was exposed. Because I didn't live every I didn't live every day leaning on the goodness of Jesus. I lived every day leaning on my ability to be good. And this is being a worship leader. I didn't live every day soaking in the great love of God. I lived every day leaning on my ability to keep being perfect. And also what happened was a subtle replacement. The gospel was replaced with the approval of man. All of a sudden, I didn't live every day from the place that I've been given in Christ. I lived every day to simply get the approval of man. As long as people were happy with me, then all things were good with God. But what the Lord reminded me during that season... He called me back home and I had to repent. And all of a sudden, the love of Christ, the lavish heart of Christ lit up in my life again. His lavish love came alive and he exposed my law-ish heart where I depended on my good works and my good things. Here's the problem with good works is you are not perfect and I am not perfect. And if you lean on good works, you can never be good enough to earn the things of God because you're going to have good days, but sweetheart, you're going to have bad days too. And if you're living out of good works, there will be very, 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 very bad days. Why? Because you're not perfect. 
I was having good days and then I would have bad days. Because when I would have approval, it was good. When I would have disapproval, it was bad. When I had a good day, it was good. But then all of a sudden, in my misery, I would have bad days. And I would wonder where the love of God had gone. But all of a sudden, I learned again the gospel of Jesus. That the Lord came to a bunch of dead people and gave them life. And they didn't earn it and they didn't deserve it. And the Lord reminded me, who had led worship and done all those things, that I was living out of a works mentality. And he said to me, son, you didn't earn me, you didn't deserve me, and you still can't earn me, and you still don't deserve me. You're going to have to stop trusting in yourself, and you're going to have to trust in me again. You're going to have to learn what it means to walk and live and trust in Jesus for all of it. Uh, You're going to have to learn to live again and stop depending on yourself and stop depending on approval and stop depending on perfection. You've got to move out of works and move into grace. You've got to move out of confidence in the flesh and move into confidence. Confidence in the work of Jesus. You've got to move out of the things of, of, of a works based mentality and move into a heart that is settled in the love of God. 12 year old child, you didn't earn your way in in the first place. Why in the world do you think you can earn your keep while you're still here? The gospel of Jesus sets us free from works based. Does it mean that we don't work? No. It doesn't mean that. It means that my motive for doing what I do is not to earn his smile. It's because I've got his smile. It means the motive for what I do is not to gain an identity. It's because I have an identity in him. It's not to gain his love. It's because I have his love. And all of a sudden, out of my heart erupted a love for the Lord that that was overwhelming. It was overwhelming, and I still didn't want to be a pastor, but it overwhelmed me. It overwhelmed me, and it rushed up inside of me, and the Lord broke works-based mentality, and all of a sudden, when I led worship, we, went to, we were leading at another church. All of a sudden, as I led worship, all I had to do was just sit back and begin to declare the goodness of God. And what would happen is people would begin to be set free. Not because I was being perfect, but because I decided to just set, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to settle in him. I'm going to settle in him. And I'm going to begin to function out of him. I'm going to begin to function out of his goodness, not my goodness. I'm going to begin to, I'm, I'm going to begin to minister out of his mercy, not my ability to generate something. And as we led worship, this other place where we were, there were moments that the Holy Spirit began to move so beautifully. It was like, uh, there was a moment where there was a, a couple, they were living together. And the uh, Holy Spirit was moving so powerfully. They, they rushed out of the sanctuary. They ran down the back steps of this building. They found somebody and they said, we have to get married. The Holy Spirit is convicting us. We have to get married. Who do we talk to about getting married? So they were routed to the right location and conviction began to flow in the house not because I was being perfect enough but because I decided to back up and settle in the love of God. Miracles came not because we were perfect but because we remember that he is perfect. Life began to flow not because I could work up something because he had already done all the work and I had to rest in his work. What the Lord reminded me of in that season was that I wasn't living to try to gain his heart. I wasn't living for his heart. I was living from his heart. I had been already placed in the love of God. I wasn't living for his smile. I was living from his smile. Already he looked at me and said, you're my son. I got you. I got you. I wasn't living to gain an identity. I was living out of an identity that I've been given. And it was in that beautiful place that the Lord woke me up. And I fell in love with the Savior again. 
who is good enough and strong enough and able enough to deserve my every breath for the rest of my life. He set me free from being works-based. Did it mean I didn't work for him? No. Actually, what happened is when my, when my heart lit back up in love with Jesus, then, it, then that's when you say, Lord, I don't care what, I belong to you. you. You name it, I'm gone. All I want to do is serve you because you've been so good to me. All I want to do is serve you because you've been so good to me. I found great freedom in depending on his goodness and not my goodness. I found great strength in depending on his work and not my work. I found great help in finding his perfection. I'm not trying to get perfect myself. And it wasn't many months after that that we got a phone call. Bishop down in Georgia saying, Pastor Ryan, well, he didn't call me Pastor Ryan because I wasn't a pastor. Plain old Ryan. Would you consider coming to pastor? And the Lord had woken my heart up. I knew he loved me. I knew that he set a flame in me again. I knew that he had, my heart was on fire in love for Jesus. I didn't want to be a pastor, but I wanted to obey Jesus. So with eyes completely on Christ, I said, yeah, I don't think I'm going to pastor the church, but I'll come down and preach. And I went down to the little church in Georgia, and I preached evangelism explosion to them. Grace. Heaven is a free gift. It is not earned, and it is not deserved. Man is a sinner, and he cannot save himself. God is loving, but he's also just. How did the Lord solve the problem of our great need? He sent Jesus. He sent Jesus. How did the Lord solve the problem? He sent Jesus. And the lavish heart of God was poured out on us. And I preached that to that little church. And I felt it. And I knew that nothing else. I was going to have to obey him. And they said, will you be our pastor? I was then so in love with the Lord. I said, yes. And I want you to hear this today. If there's anything that you leave this place with, when you walk out of Christian Life International, this is a, this is a moment. This is the only moment that we will all be together exactly like this. If you leave this place with anything, leave with a reignited passion in love with Jesus and shed a works-based mentality. Shed it. Shed that perfectionism. Shed those things and say, I'm going to live solely resting in the great work of Jesus. And I want to promise you something. Your heart will light up on fire with love for the Lord. His lavish love has been poured on us. He loved us when we were dead. He's not going to love you anymore if you keep yourself all pretty. Lord, break the legalistic spirit off of our lives. Legalism be gone in the name of Jesus. Legalism is, legalism is, is what we say when we say the gospel Plus, being very good equals something better than the gospel. That's a lie from hell. Because there's only one, there's only one, there's only one equation. The gospel plus nothing else is the gospel. It's not Jesus and what you can produce. That's legalism. It is Jesus. Jesus alone. Jesus' perfection, Jesus' strength, and the goodness of God expressed to us through Jesus. That's our hope, that's our, that's our foundation, that's what we build everything that we are on, on Jesus, who is the hope of all things. 
Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Go to the, go to the beginning of chapter 3, please. Paul, Paul writes to the Galatians, and the church in Galatia was at a spot very much like I was in. Judaizers had come in, and they came in with the equation, Jesus plus some Jewish traditions equals something better than the gospel. That's how they came in. Jesus plus other stuff is going to be better. And look at what Paul says to them. He says to them, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works that you did or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish after beginning by the means of the Spirit... Are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain? If it really was in vain? I love this verse 5. Look, so I ask, oh again I ask, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? So Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Go to the next verse for me. There you go. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Now look, verse 10, and we'll stop right here. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, curse is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. All right, we'll just pause right there. What the Lord did in me, you can live this world, in this world, being of faith and of grace or of works. I had started living of works. And to experience revival in my life, I had to repent of being of works and come back in to walking in faith in Jesus. That's what I had to do. And I I love, uh, if you could back it up to verse 5 for me. This blesses me. We'll mention this and then then we're going to finish here today. So again, I ask, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? (laughs) Loved ones, this blesses me. We need miracles in this place. Amen? We need the moving of the Holy Spirit. We need it in this generation. We need him functioning in this place. Galatians reminds me. That for the Lord to work in power and through miracles, it's not going to be when we get a bunch of pre- when we get pretty enough and we get all things lined up just right and when we get all things correct. No, the Lord will move in power when we lean on the gospel and the good news of Jesus. People won't be set free when we get good at playing this game. People will be set free when we believe the good news of Jesus. I I, I want to present this thought to you. The lack of the moving of God in in the body of Christ in our generation is not but the government's fault. The lack of the moving of the the Lord in the body of Christ is, is not the broken world's fault. Perhaps the lack of the move of God is come solely back to the reality that we have a deficit of the gospel and the good news of Jesus. Because when I lean in him, I lean into his goodness, I lean into his mercy, I lean into his grace, all of a sudden, you know what, the whole world will move out of the way because what I found is Jesus, Jesus alone. And when I'm obeying him and I'm leaning solely on the gospel, then the Holy Spirit says, yes, because the gospel is clear and free and being proclaimed, now I will heal, now I will work miracles, not because y'all are good enough, but because you believe that Jesus is the one that does it may it be in this place let it be in this place let it never be man we are getting really good we're getting really good God's got to do something now no 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 
may he increase and may we decrease. And rather than saying, hey, we're getting good, why don't we say, man, he is good. He is good. And there's nothing that he won't do for his people when they call on his name. Dear friends, even today, even today there are some that are in here because we're all human. There's some that are in here and you're on a journey trying to find Perhaps you're walking through a season of difficulty. Perhaps you're walking through a season of struggle. At times, we, we run all kinds of ways to try to find out what the problem is down in the core of our hearts. We go searching. Sometimes we, we begin to dig into things that perhaps maybe our parents were part of or maybe things that were done to us. Or, or we look at our personalities. We look at all those things. But most often, as a, as a pastor, what I've found is that when you track it down, what really, really, really sets people free is not when they figure out the problem. What really, really sets people free is when they realize there is a good Savior. He is faithful, and He is loving, and He is kind, and He has called me His child. I'm going to live out of that strength, out of that place of faith. And from that place of faith, then the enemy will flee most often what I find in our heart problems is a gospel deficit maybe today your struggle is a gospel deficit that's what it was for me a gospel deficit Uh, worship team come Cameron and team come quickly come quickly bow your heads with me loved ones father I thank you so much for this moment I thank you for this time thank you for your heart